are we alone in the universe? I doubt it. You doubt it? Oh, you doubt it. Okay. Why do, what, what are your doubts based on? Well, I'm, uh, so now, is it okay if I now go into a little bit of detail? Yeah, anything, yeah. anything. Whatever makes your mind say, I doubt it. So maybe I should say another, uh, um, so when you say, what do you do? So uh, I said molecular astrophysics, maybe I should use it a little bit more easy to that. So, so I'm a professor of astrochemistry at the University of Leiden. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So I'm a professor of astrochemistry at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, so as an astrochemist, I actually study what molecules are available in the sites at which new stars and new planets like our Earth, are born. Mm -hmm. um, I look at water, um, and I look at complex organic molecules that could form the basis for prebiotic molecules. Okay. And one of the things that we've learned, actually, through a generation of telescopes getting more and more powerful, uh, most recently is the ALMA telescope, is that um, basically around every forming star uh, we have quite a lot of water available and also complex organic molecules. So the ingredients for life are everywhere. So basically that's my conclusion. The ingredients for life, the building blocks for life are available around every forming star. Well, um, oh, sorry, I should say the, the building blocks for life are, yeah. So basically the ingredients for life, the building blocks for life are available around every forming star on scales of our own solar system. Well, I have the building blocks for a fire in my <laughs> office, us. but I don't have a fire. <laughs> so you, if you have the ingredients, that doesn't necessarily follow that you have the recipe. Well, indeed. So I'm, I'm sort of a chemist, also by training, and I say here are the, the chemical ingredients. Now it's up to the biologist, basically, to make the fire, to make it into... Uh, but in make it, make it Making it into basically... Uh, right, but in saying that you sure. doubt that we're alone, you're assuming that they can do that fairly easily. Right, yes. So uh, that statement uh, is, is based, and that goes back, I think, okay. So that statement is, basic, is based on my conversation with chemists and uh, chemical biologists. And uh, going back, actually, to the, I think, fundamental work of Christian de Duve, who said that chemistry will find a way. Mm -hmm. You know, there could Controversially, be he says, like, life is a cosmic imperative. If, yes, <laughs> yes. But I, I, like the, I like the formulation, chemistry will find a way. <laughs> chemistry will find a way. Well, <laughs> all right. So, you, so because of that kind of hand-waving argument, you think that we're probably not alone. Right. So again, the, the hard evidence that we have is that the basic ingredients right. are available everywhere. Now you need some liquid water, mm -hmm. so, um, so, so that you need to provide in some way. Uh, but then there are you know, many chemical reactions that can get you to amino acids, that can get you maybe to uh, RNA type um, compounds. So, so I think in that sense, you know, there is a good way of making these steps from chemistry then to eventually uh, origin of life. So to try to summarize, you doubt that we're alone because you, your science tells you that the ingredients of life are everywhere and your chemistry friends say that, well, it's probably not too difficult to make life. <laughs> chemistry will not, find a not way. Not too difficult, but it, it will find a way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's, that's your argument. Okay. All right. So in the question, are we alone, what does the word we mean? Uh, I think usually we take we to mean we here on Earth. Are we on Earth the only ones in the, in the universe? We human Months, beings on yeah. Earth or we the life forms on Earth? I would say we the life forms we on life Earth. Forms. Okay. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. if you had said we, the human beings, I'd say, well, we know the answer. We're not alone because we've got the truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> now, do you, how about the idea of being alone? Some people think that if we find microbes on Mars or anywhere, that we will still be alone because we won't have anybody to talk to. So they have this, this I, I'm not looking for microbes. I'm looking for you know, some type of omniscient God who knows things and I can talk to. So they would still be alone 
even if we found life or some life that we couldn't talk to. Right. Do you agree right. with that? or? Uh, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I think when I said I doubt that we are alone, I really meant, you know, including the, the most primitive forms of life. That, okay, yeah, so let's, yeah. set, let's pretend, though, that we're going to identify with these people. Yeah. And let's ask, do you think that there are other intelligent life forms like us out there? Well, that, uh, I think the chances become already, you know, smaller and that that I have really no good <laughs> so, no good argument so, one way or another for it. <laughs> so you're happy with the chemists who tell you that chemistry will find a way right. but you're not happy with uh, paleontologists like Simon Conway no, Morris no. who says oh uh, animal life will find a way to become intelligent. Oh, yes. So there you're less convinced of it. Uh, there I think we uh, we know one example here on earth and uh, where that where that happens, uh, I mean, sort of, <laughs> I, sh I should say, one example, I mean, one sort of whole system where that has happened. Um, uh, so, so there, I really don't, uh, don't have an independent opinion from what okay. the others say. Now, the idea of astrobiology is, are, a lot of people are enthusiastic about it because it's kind of like developing a Genesis story for how we got here. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like the scientific version of Genesis. Now, do, is that important for a human being? I, some human beings, do you think that's important for you to find out how you got here personally? Uh, well, I, I think everybody, including myself, wants to know what his or her place is in the universe. I mean, if we stop asking those questions, I doubt that we are, sort of, it, it's part of, of what we are. I mean, our uh, inquisitiveness of, of, of knowing where we come from and what our place is in the universe. So, so I think, yes, uh, it is an important question to answer. But you, I agree, of course, yeah, with you, and you agree with yourself, but quite a few people are not astrobiologists. And right. they're not that interested in the question. Well, more when, 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 I, when I go and give a public talk for the, the general public, which I do quite often, then I find that a lot of people are interested in actually in the, in, in the discourse. A lot of people are interested yes, in this question. Yes, there are, but the probably majority don't care. Uh, I think you just need to look up on a clear sky, and you have plenty of clear skies here in Australia, actually, to look up to, and you can't help but wonder. You know, what our place is this tiny little rock there in the, in the vast universe. <laughs> so answering the question, how did we get here, you think is an important question? Uh, yes, definitely, definitely. Is it the most important question? I think it's one of the, the few very fundamental questions that humankind has to answer. What are the other few? Uh, maybe how the universe originated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that would be another big one. But, uh, and then how it is evolving. But I think this is, you know, up there is the very top. How about the question of meaning? Some people think that what's the meaning of life is an important one. Many scientists don't think that that's an important question. I'm not sure what is meant with meaning of life. Um, I mean, we know we are, you know, even on Earth, at least we as humans are only a tiny little... Well, don't you ever get bored of what you're doing and say, what is the purpose of my life? My oh, life has no meaning. Yeah, my life has no meaning. No, no, I... <laughs> I hardly ever get that question because I'm fortunate to be in such a fascinating uh, <laughs> profession that I can't help, which is also happens to me, that profession also happens to be my hobby, so I can't help in being <laughs> not nice. bored all the nice. time. <laughs> so it's other people's <coughs> problems, not yours. <laughs> then. So let's ask, what part of your research is most relevant to answering the question, are we alone? Um, I think... Twofold. One is on the ingredients that we just talked about. Basically, is there water? Is there complex organic material associated to star and planet formation? I think the other part that is very relevant and um, that is now in a you know, big state of uh, revolution at the moment is, is how planets are formed. Uh, the planet forming disks that we are now starting to resolve with ALMA. Uh, seeing how much material there is available to build planets. Is there enough material to make an Earth? Is there enough material to make a Jupiter? Um, how does that vary this time? Uh, when and how did this happen um, as a function of position in the disk? Uh, can we form planets in the habitable zones? 
I mean, these are all questions that are mm -hmm. very much now at the, the forefront of astronomy. Yeah. How about the time dependence of the chemical abundances in the universe? For, I think I just wrote a paper saying, you know what, life depends on things like C and O and H and N, mm. and planets, depend, like rocky planets, depend on S, I and O and M, G, yeah. and the C and Ns and Os seem to have been produced <coughs> more abundantly earlier than the S, Is and F, Es and M, Gs. Would you agree with that? Um, yes and no. Yes, in terms of that's what stellar evolution models also tell you. Uh, no, in the sense that we have found dusty galaxies all the way at the edge of the universe. I mean, we see the dust emission coming from galaxies with redshifts uh, more than eight. So, um, and I'm not sure. But we're starting to see the, the average metallicity go down as you get to that high redshift, though, um, by factors of 10. Yes, that could be, but there are certainly also extreme examples. So I think it depends on the technique that you're using in order to determine those metal abundances. Certainly, if you look at the uh, more diffuse gas that you probe through the quasar absorption lines, <clears throat> then I think there is a trend of going to very low metallicities at high redshifts. Um, if you look at the continuum emission from dust that we see at millimeter wavelengths or at far infrared wavelengths, um, then I think um, there are, uh, and also the carbon monoxide molecule, uh, then I think there are uh, galaxies at high redshift that have close to solar uh, metallicities for oh. some reasons that I don't understand. So, so, so let's play, let's play <coughs> theorists and say, okay, I'm going to take the sun or molecular cloud that mm. formed the sun. I'm going to turn down the metallicity. How far do I have to turn down the metallicity before I do not get a rocky planet with water on the surface and then life? Well, I think in general you need to turn down the metallicity to about 10 to minus 3 of solar. 1,000 of solar. solar to, well, no, this is not necessarily to get a rocky planet, but to get molecular hydrogen. So, I yeah. mean, if one. I think a lot of the chemistry and everything else starts with, and, and making stars, <laughs> and having dense enough molecular clouds starts with making the molecular hydrogens. And the moment that your metal fraction is so low that um, you don't, you know, you don't have enough dust grains anymore, um, then uh, to form molecular hydrogen, then I think everything becomes very different, but, like 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 the, the first stars in the universe right. were very different from the stars that we have But now. I'm interested not in Jupiters, I'm interested in Earths. Yeah. Right. right. But I think you need you need to have sort of that to have your first your cloud collapse to form a star with sure, a disk have around it. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. But the yeah. question is do you have to have at least what in order to form an Earth? Well that that I I'm not sure <laughs> that I know the answer to that okay. question. All right. Very good. And how would you recognize, what do you suggest, if I gave you a hundred billion dollars mm. with the caveat, you have to spend this money to try to answer the question, to help answer the question, are we alone? How would you spend it? Um, I have two options. Um, one is uh, an Alma in space. <laughs> <laughs> an Alma in space. Okay. <clears throat> so, how would that contribute to answering the question, are we alone? Well, I think that basically allows to go... Um, uh, Okay, I think an Alma in space would actually allow you to image water and uh, water snow lines uh, that may be important for planet formation uh, in the habitable zones. So basically getting down to that resolution um, and being able to observe water. Um, so I think that that is basically one very important. But that's only in protoplanetary disk. That's right? only in <coughs> that's probably the problem that is. I think the other one that may be more directly relevant is that you have a big optical infrared telescope in space and then you need to think of at least say 15 meter diameters. So not the James Webb. No, James Webb is not yet big enough but that you can do sort of um, take spectra of directly imaged planets. So, so it's like 10 times bigger than James Webb? Uh, that would be very big. <laughs> That's, uh, I don't think that that is possible yet but I mean something that is uh, at least uh, three times two to 
I think something that is at least two to three times as big as uh, JVST is uh, the minimum that you and need. And then you for think this. you can put an infrared spectrograph to get some lines out of the atmosphere. Then you could, then you would get the spectra, both of the visible near infrared, and, and that would actually be a separate mission to get also the mid infrared. So then you would get all of the diagnostics that you need to um, to answer the. Okay. Then you would actually cover all of the possible biomarkers and uh, then sort of uh, the combination of which is needed in order to answer this question. Now, there seems to be some ambiguity about what life is in general. For example, I ask biologists about viruses and say, are viruses alive? And then half of them say yes and half of them say no. Do you have a horse in that race at all? No. no, so <laughs> no. You don't talk to <laughs> I, I don't talk that often to that. Okay. <laughs> no. Well, but do you have an idea what life is? You must have some working hypothesis for it. Yeah, and, and I mean, I know it has to replicate and everything, but um, no, I'd rather not go in that direction. Okay, so, but that. you are a life form. I'm a life form. Yes, I think I'm a life. Are you an alien? <laughs> Uh, I don't come from outer space, if that is what you mean. I, I thought we all came from outer <laughs> space. <right? laughs> well, that's true. My ingredients come from outer space. <laughs> so have you ever seen a UFO? Um, no, I don't think so. No. Have you ever been abducted by an alien? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> uh, what kind of alien would you like to find? You said that you doubt that we're alone, so that means it's likely, if you think, that there are other life forms elsewhere. Uh, what kind of life do you think is out there and then next question, what kind of life would you like to find? Oh, that's a, yeah, the, <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I, th I think first I would like to find just some of the beautiful things that we see on our own planet in terms of life forms like the, the trees, the flowers, um, those kinds of life forms. Okay. I mean, that's, uh, that I certainly would like to see first. Okay, those are the ones you'd like. So, <laughs> So when I ask some physicists this question, yeah. they want uh, all-knowing, omniscient kind of thing that can help them solve their physics problems and get a theory of everything. And you just re answered in a very aesthetic way. Yeah, yeah. So you want beautiful, pretty, or benign. Well, and I, first, first, that would be the first thing I would look for. You of course, I've, I've animals. seen <laughs> plants, not animals. Is that right? No, I've seen enough science fiction movies to, to know what it can look like. <laughs> Uh, well, you said you you saw, but you're joking. No. So, if you were in charge of making these movies and you wanted to be as realistic as possible, how would you conceive of these life forms that you think are probably out there? Well, that's yeah. I haven't thought about that. My, I haven't thought about the question of making the, that kind of movie myself <laughs> and what the one I would put in. <laughs> but you have some vision that tells you that's wrong when you see. Well, a movie. let's say that most of the sort of. Um, Hollywood versions um, always go a little bit extreme on the scary side, and I'd like to think that that is not necessarily the case. <laughs> but, but there are also good aliens, like E.T. and Yoda. Yoda, right? Yoda, maybe, <laughs> yes, that would be. So I, in terms of, you know, having aliens that you could ask questions indeed as to their vision as to how we came about, I think that would be fascinating. Yeah. So, so more advanced. Do you think there's any there's any meaning to this word more advanced than we are? Mm. I don't think that we are the most advanced life form possible. In that well, way. if that's if that's true, then in the galaxy there's a more advanced civilization. And if that's true, they should have colonized the galaxy because they had plenty of time. And there, that raises the Fermi paradox. Yeah. Where is everybody? Is everybody? So, do you have any favorite solutions to the Fermi paradox? Or nope. do, you th do you think it is a paradox? Um, not necessarily, if you also take into account the, the time scale over which that civilization is basically uh, um, at its peak. <laughs> so you think all civilizations kill themselves? Uh, unfortunately, I think that a lot of... <laughs> no, wait, wait, wait that, a lot doesn't work. A lot won't ch solve yeah, the paradox. paradox. It has to be 100%. No, no, depends, yes. <laughs> So I'm not going to buy the a lot. Well, no, 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 no. Well, there definitely, <laughs> there definitely is a tendency for civilizations to um, be. Uh, there's definitely a tendency for a civilization to have a destructive streak as well. Let's put it like that. Oh, I think we all agree on <laughs> that. that. What we disagree on is 
wait a minute, you have to have all of them self-destruct in order to solve of the, the five paradox. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so, well, do you think that's the case? I don't know. I don't know. That's so you have no solution. Don't you have a I favorite solution? No, no, I don't have a favorite solution. All right. <laughs> um, let's see. Now, if I give you a hundred billion dollars, you said you'd build a space alma and then a giant space telescope, right? Yeah. So you would not invest in microscopes to look for nano aliens. Mm, oh, you mean like the? They might be in this room, tiny little <coughs> aliens that are. In other words, maybe there is life everywhere, but it's so tiny we haven't discovered it yet. <laughs> that's uh, uh, that's that. Well, that would be uh, that would be fascinating as well. But we have pretty powerful microscope these days. Uh, if I look at <laughs> if I look at all, my colleagues, all of the anomalies are chucked in the dustbin. Mm. <laughs> Whenever they see something, they don't. Just, we don't know what that well, is. That, okay, that, that, that's, yeah, that could be. But um, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> now, Arthur C. Clarke said that uh, any sufficiently advanced civilization will be indistinguishable from magic. And there's a German guy, Schroeder, I think his name, and he says, no, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced civilization will be in, indistinguishable from nature. And in other words, when you get more advanced, you get more ecological, sustainable, and you don't make parking lots. You make you are consistent with being a rainforest, which then makes you harder to detect. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's correct, or do you have any uh, any comments on that? No, not not any. <laughs> okay. Now, <laughs> in the movie, have you seen the movie Contact? Yes, a long time ago. Uh, did you meet Carl Sagan at all? Um, I must have met him a couple of times, yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Anyway, in the movie Cro uh, Contact, at the end, a little child Held. asks Jodie Foster, and several times through the movie, they say, are we alone? And then the scientist says, well, if we are, it's an awful waste of space. And some people think that's funny, and other people think it's kind of a racist thing to say, speciesist mm -hmm. thing. What, what do you comment on that? Um... Hmm. Awful waste of space. That's. Uh, yeah, it's it's a bit of a puzzling. Uh, that's a good point. <laughs> why why did Carl write that particular? I haven't read the book, so I just saw it in the movie. I it probably is in the book, but I don't know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's in the movie three times. Three times, <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I haven't thought about it recently. <laughs> that, but that's that's. Uh, um, well, I mean, I, I guess it basically goes in the same same direction as we've been talking about. That's you know, there are so many galaxies and so many stars and planets and so many ingredients and so many ingredients for. So many chemical ingredients, so many discs that you know the chance of that space being completely wasted <laughs> in terms of life would be very surprising. Now I've talked to quite a few biologists yeah. and physicists about this question, and uh, usually the biolog and I ask, um, do you expect intelligent aliens with human-like intelligence or functional equivalent of of humans? And the biologists usually say no. And the physicists usually say yes. And so it's surprising that physicists have such strong opinions about the evolution of human intelligence. But the biologists are usually say, no, you know, humans are unique and you don't expect other species to evolve in that direction. Do you have any thoughts about this? You're a physicist, so you, you should say, oh, it's intelligent aliens all over the universe. <laughs> No, no, I think this comes back to one of the earlier questions uh, that we had that, uh, you know, from chemist, from basically the ingredients using chemistry to get to primitive life, I think there are many options. Then how we get from primitive life to, to intelligent life, um, that, that is a, a step that I, cannot <laughs> that I cannot comment about, so that I have no independent knowledge of. And I doubt that all of my physicists colleagues have. <laughs> Good, good. We, share, we share that skepticism. Yeah, so, but yeah. well, well, then what's your attitude towards SETI? Oh, uh, because then, that to SETI to some extent depends on that assumption. Yeah, yes, absolutely, absolutely. 
Um, I yeah, so I I I think it's uh, it's a brave attempt that they are doing, and it's probably something that should be done. But I think the chances of finding anything are very very slim. But uh, despite the fact that you think we're probably not alone, right, right. But that's why I really like the the sort of the next step in terms of the scientific approach, um, which is to look for signs of life, mostly primitive life, probably uh, in the spectra of exoplanet atmospheres. Yeah. So that's the most legitimate scientific way. Right, and by now, by now we have actually, um, you know, a large number of possible targets that we that we can look at because we are finding sort of these planets in the uh, habitable zone. Uh, SETI is, of course, also looking only at the, you know, a limited sample of, right. of, of sources. I think Carl Sagan also said something like, "We are the way the." We are a way for the universe to be conscious of itself. Right. By chance, that particular sentence is used by one of my PhD students as the first sentence of her thesis. Uh -huh. okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? Do you agree with it? Do you disagree with it? you don't care? You... No, I, I think it's actually a deep, uh, a deep sentence that's, uh, um, that sort of completes the circle. That's <laughs> well, I have a dog who's very good at smelling, and is that dog the way the universe has learned to smell itself? <laughs> I don't know. Because dogs are much better than us at smelling. I know, right? I so know. I know. I don't, okay, I don't <laughs> mean that. Yeah, they, they spell the horrible. Uh, no. So I'm, I'm trying to undermine My, the significance of that statement yeah, by saying, well, every life form has a certain type of intelligence, and ours is one way, and other dogs have another. Yeah. Or, for example, are plants the universe's way to photosynthesize itself? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that it's basically what it's telling us is that, you know, every species here on Earth has a function in the whole ecosystem, and they are important in, uh, and they excel in some aspects that we humans don't excel in. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> but do you think that range of functional space is inhabited completely? on life on Earth, or are there lots of other functionalities that nothing on Earth can do? And like, how full is the ecosystem? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's a deep question that I... Uh, <laughs> that, that would be interesting to see how you would try to answer that, because that means that you need to know something about the universe that we don't know yet. <laughs> then. Okay, now you've, given, you, you've said that you've given lots of public talks. Yeah. Now, what do you think is the big, the public's biggest misconception about this question, are we alone? Um, let me see. Um, Yeah, so I think there are various aspects to that question, what the, what the public's uh, opinion is. So there's certainly one group of people who think in terms of the, the aliens, uh, the uh, sort of the ET types. <laughs> that, the Hollywood addicts. The, the Hollywood <laughs> addicts, that they, they are certainly one uh, aspect. Uh, they're, they're certainly one, one group of people that only can think in terms of sort of also intelligent life that, uh, that would be there. So you think that's a misconception? Uh, that that could be a miscon that could be a misconception. Yes, mm -hmm. um, there is another group that basically thinks that black holes have something to do with origins of life. Because uh -huh. <laughs> okay. that's a question that I very often get. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, they say. Did life come from a black hole? Is that what they say? Well, they, they say what do black holes have to do is this. So okay, they, okay. they are they are so so sort of <laughs> they have heard so much about black holes. Well, two mysteries: they, black, they black holes and origin of life. life they're <laughs> putting them together. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think that that could be a misconception. Um, but on the other, I think overall, I find that uh, the public certainly in the sort of the more recent decade is becoming more educated about that. I think all of the uh, public outreach that's being done on exoplanets um, has sort of hit home to, to show that you know, our solar system is not the only one uh, in the universe, that there are other planets around other stars, that those planets you know, could have oceans. And so I think people are think starting to, to think more 
in that direction. Yeah. And do you have any advice for young <clears throat> students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists and going into this field? So I, I, would, I would rather say I have an advice for anybody who goes into a very interdisciplinary field, and that is make sure you're very good in one aspect of that multidisciplinary field, whether it's chemistry, whether it's biology, whether it's astronomy, make sure that you have your, you know, your foot firmly planted in one of those disciplines. But then you need to sort of learn about those other, uh, <coughs> you need to learn about those other uh, disciplines and and there you need to be very open you need to learn a lot uh, you need to read a lot you need to learn first to speak the other people's language and there's so much terminology going on that takes almost a year to get familiar with <laughs> uh, and that takes time but the most important thing is that you're firmly rooted in one of the the aspects of the multidisciplinary program all right and are we alone in the universe <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> and why do you doubt it? <laughs> well, I <laughs> okay. Well, well, I doubt that we are alone simply because there are so many. Okay. Well, I, I doubt that we are alone because simply because there are so many uh, ingredients available to make uh, biotic material. There's also so many options. Uh, to build planets around other stars. There's so many billions, hundreds of billions of planets <laughs> in our galaxies and then also in the universe, so I doubt it. <laughs> so cosmologists seem to suggest that the universe is flat and that suggests that the universe might be spatially infinite. Now if that's the case, then anything that can happen will happen an infinite number of times. So then the question is, what's the probability of you and me having this conversation? And if it's epsilon greater than zero, then it's an infinite number of them going on in the universe. Uh -huh. Can you? What do you think of that argument? <laughs> well, it would be nice to, to think that, <laughs> that we might be having this conversation also be, somewhere I, else. <laughs> really, I thought it would be nicer if we were <laughs> unique. I don't know. Yeah. What, what, why do you say it's nicer if there are an infinite number of the same things going on? Well, no, well. As opposed to just this one, this is just here. Well, <laughs> yeah, um, I, I never like to think of the way, I never like the argument that we are completely unique, that um, we may be unique in time and in place in the universe, but to think that over the whole age of the universe, we are really, you know, the only unique planet with this kind of life, then... Well, well, we're speaking English right now, yeah. and if the probability of English evolving somewhere is epsilon and not zero, then other aliens speak English. Do you think <laughs> that's true? Um, I, no, well, <laughs> now, you're, now we're getting into probabilities. Yes, <laughs> yes, we are. yes, we are. I thought I'd ask you a probability <laughs> well, question. Probability, I'm not going to go in that direction. You're not going to go in that no, 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 Okay. okay.